The first few hours of most Final Fantasy games are masterclasses in storytelling, skillfully blending cinematic grandeur with immersive gameplay to captivate players right from the beginning of these games. Each installment in the series has a unique world meticulously crafted with lots of rich lore, complex characters, and so many conflicts that set the stage for all of these epic journeys that we've been enjoying for almost 40 years now as a series. And these initial moments are designed to draw players into their respective narratives, establishing emotional stakes and narrative of depth that's going to hook you in straight away. So in today's video, I'm going to be covering what I consider to be my favorite and maybe the best intros to Final Fantasy games in the entire series of mainline games. As always, don't forget to like this video and subscribe if you're not already and leave a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts on Final Fantasy intros. Which ones are your favorite in the mainline series? I would love to know. Anyway, let's get to the first one. This is a really great and iconic opening. Check it out. First up, we have the intro to Final Fantasy X. The intro to Final Fantasy X has always interested me. Of course, when you start the game, you see the campfire scene where Titus and his companions resting in reflective silence under a starry sky, hinting at the gravity of their journey. Then, of course, it moves to the bustling, futuristic city of Xanarkin, where Titus is a celebrated blitzball player. And during a major game, the city is suddenly attacked by a massive, mysterious entity known as Sin, causing widespread chaos and destruction. Amidst the turmoil, Titus is swept into a vortex created by Sin, transported him into the unfamiliar and ancient world, seemingly, of Spira. In Spira, Titus finds himself in the ruins of a submerged city. After encountering creatures and struggling for survival, he is rescued by a group of salvagers called the Albed, and among them is a girl named Riku, who becomes his first ally. Their time together is cut short when they're attacked again, getting separated, and Titus then washes ashore on the island of Besaid, where he meets Waka, another blitzball player, and the guardian of a summoner named Yuna. And as Titus integrates with the Besaid community, he learns about the summoner's pilgrimage to defeat Sin and, of course, meets Yuna, who's preparing for her own journey to defeat Sin and, you know, bring peace to the world. Intrigued and with no other options, Titus decides to join Yuna's guardians, hoping to find a way back to Xanarkand. Now, this marks the beginning of the perilous journey across Spira, gradually uncovering more about the world's struggles, the nature of Sin, and his own unexpected role in the fate of Spira. And in my opinion, the intro to Final Fantasy X is absolutely legendary. I love this. It gets you hooked straight away because there's so many twists and turns in the first few hours of this game. I love it. If you haven't played Final Fantasy X, I mean, come on, go play it. It's one of my favorite stories in Final Fantasy. Next up, we have the absolutely iconic opening of Final Fantasy VI with this atmospheric prologue showcasing a world where magic has faded and technology reigns supreme. The game begins with this iconic scene, a trio of Imperial soldiers, including a mysterious enslaved woman named Terra, piloting Magitek armor through a snowy landscape toward the town of Narsh. Terra, under mind control, is compelled to aid the Empire in retrieving an ancient magical creature called an Esper. And in the first few hours of the game, players experience the raid on Narsh, where Terra's abilities and the Empire's ruthless pursuit of power are showcased. And during the mission, the team encounters the Esper, which reacts powerfully to Terra, breaking her free from the mind control device. And Terra is rescued by the local resistance leader, who helps her escape. And struggling with amnesia and pursued by Imperial forces, Terra eventually meets Locke, a treasure hunter, and part of the Returners, a group rebelling against the Empire. And of course, the narrative quickly expands as Terra and Locke meeting key characters like Edgar, the King of Figaro, and his brother Sabin. And the story delves into the backgrounds and motivations, fleshing out the really rich and interconnected histories of the cast. And through these interactions, you learn about the oppressive regime of Emperor Gestal and the menacing Kefka, setting the stage for a broader conflict. I mean, these early hours of Final Fantasy VI, mixing intense battles, emotional moments, really lay the groundwork for an epic journey that is just a timeless game. You know, you've got themes of identity, resistance, and the rediscovery of lost magic as well. It's a really great steampunk themed game. I love Final Fantasy VI, and especially the opening crawl of the game. Another great one is Final Fantasy XVI, beginning with a dark and intense opening that sets the stage for the tale of political intrigue, magic, and personal vendettas, introducing players to the world of Valestia, a land blessed, and cursed by enormous mother crystals that grant magic but also bring conflict. The protagonist Clive Rossfield serves as the protector for his younger brother Joshua, the dominant of Phoenix, and the story kicks off with a dramatic and devastating attack to their homeland, and it results in tragedy and an immense personal loss 
for Clive. And the first few hours of gameplay follow Clive's journey from a loyal and skilled warrior to a vengeful and determined figure seeking answers in retribution. We witness Clive's transformation as he grapples with the trauma of losing his family and the betrayal that led to the fall of his nation. Clive's quest for revenge and understanding takes him across Valestia, uncovering hidden truths about the Mother Crystals, the icons, and the dark forces at play. The first few hours of Final Fantasy 16 has a really great blend of intense combat, emotional storytelling, and setting up a grand and epic adventure that delves into themes of you know, power, legacy, and the struggle to control a world that's seemingly on the edge of chaos. And through Clive's eyes, players are drawn into a really great narrative that promises so much intrigue. So basically with Final Fantasy 16, if you've played the demo for this game, and then of course the subsequent maybe two, three hours afterwards, it, it was really something that hooked me into this game. I wasn't super keen on Final Fantasy 16 initially, but then I played the demo and I was absolutely hooked. So long as I get emotionally attached to these characters and the journeys of these characters I'm in and Final Fantasy 16 with everything I've just described had me in in just a few hours I loved it Hold on a second before we talk about any more Final Fantasy. I want to let you guys know that over 90% of the people that watch my channel on the regular are not subscribed. So hey, I would love to have you here week in and week out. But don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Anyway, on to the next one. Final Fantasy IV is another one I really enjoy and it's a game that really just immersed me in the world straight away. The intro of Final Fantasy IV begins with a dramatic scene with the Red Wings, you know, the ships of the game, where the players are introduced to Cecil Harvey, the captain of an elite airship fleet. There's a somber tone set here as Cecil reflects on the morally dubious orders he's been following, seizing powerful crystals from innocent nations under the king's command, and Cecil's growing unease comes to a head when he returns to the king and then questions the king, only to be stripped of his command and sent on a seemingly simple delivery mission with his friend Kane. The mission quickly turns tragic as the package reveals itself as a bomb, destroying the village and leaving a young girl named Rydia as the sole survivor. And horrified by the consequences of his actions, Cecil defies his orders and vows to protect Rydia. These early hours of the game focus on Cecil's journey of redemption, joined by Kane, Rydia, the other allies like Rosa, who's Cecil's love interest, and the mage twins Palum and Porum. He seeks to uncover the truth behind the king's sudden cruelty and the dark forces that might be manipulating the events from the shadows. Of course, as the story progresses, Cecil's quest for redemption becomes intertwined with a larger struggle against a malevolent sorcerer who is orchestrating a plan to gather the crystals for his own nefarious purposes. And through a series of challenging battles, personal revelations, and forging new alliances, Cecil's eventual transformation from the Dark Knight to the Paladin, the White Knight, is a really great quest for redemption and a heroic tale on saving the world from impending doom. So the first few hours of Final Fantasy IV from Cecil realizing he's done something wrong to when he finally changes over from a dark knight to a paladin. I really, really love that. And, you know, it's just a unique feeling that you have when you see this character realizing that they've been a part of this evil thing, they've done wrong, and they really want to just redeem their actions and set everything straight. I love this game. And in my opinion, I'm going to save the best for last with Final Fantasy VII. The intro of Final Fantasy VII starts with a cinematic view of the stars and the iconic scene of Aerith Gainsborough in the bustling streets of Midgar, followed by a zoom out of the city, revealing the industrial metropolis of Midgar, dominated by the Shinra Electric Power Company. Players are introduced to the protagonist Cloud, an ex-soldier turned mercenary who's hired by Avalanche, jumps off the trains, and trying to blow up the Mako reactor to halt Shinra's exploitation of the planet's life force. After the successful mission of infiltrating and destroying that first reactor, Cloud and Avalanche retreat to their hideout in the Sector 7 slums. And here we meet another key character, including Tifa, Cloud's childhood friend. And the narrative really showcases early on the oppressive influence of Shinra on the city and the environmental degradation caused by their reactors, of course, sucking the planet dry. And as the story progresses, Cloud and his friends undertake a second mission to destroy another reactor, which ends disastrously. Cloud falls into the slums of Sector 5, where he meets Aerith. This meeting sets the stage for further developments here, as Cloud becomes entangled in so much, leading to a confrontation with Shinra, raiding Shinra HQ, the reveal of Sephiroth, the early hours of Final Fantasy VII masterfully blend action, character development, and world building, setting the foundation for an epic and emotionally charged adventure. And in my opinion, the whole Midgar exposition of Final Fantasy VII is a masterclass in storytelling. 
And you know what? I might just be a Final Fantasy VII shill, according to Kupo Info. Thank you very much. But this game really sets the stage for an epic adventure. Although some might argue that the game just kind of drops off after the Midgar portion, but I really disagree. Midgar is meant to be the exposition of the game. It's meant to tell you how to play the game. And it's meant to really just deeply and emotionally invest you in these characters' motivations and journeys. I just think it's the best opening in Final Fantasy. All of the technology and stuff that went into this game with camera angles and cutscenes. I mean, it's just, man, it's an epic tale. And of course, I'm super glad that we're getting the remakes as well. So this is my favorite intros in the Final Fantasy series. I would love to know your thoughts. So don't forget to leave a comment down below and subscribe if you haven't already. And we'll see you again on the next video. Thanks for watching.